All right, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here to tell you about the History Unfolded Project. How many of you have heard of citizen history by any chance? Raise your hand if you've heard of citizen history. So some of us, but not everyone. Before I even begin talking about our project, I want to explain a little bit about the difference between traditional crowdsourcing and citizen history. Uh, and as a result, I'll talk a little bit about citizen science. So as you can see from this Venn diagram, they're similar in a lot of ways. Uh, they both rely on a core of volunteers who do authentic research uh, based in quality research. Uh, the communities are very active and it takes a certain amount of reaching out to them to uh, get their support. The main difference is in focus. So crowdsourcing focuses on collections and access goals. So transcription projects is one good example. Whereas citizen history focuses on research and educational goals. And I'll talk a little bit more about this for our particular project. Uh, citizen history comes out of the tradition of citizen science, in which for the last couple hundred years, scientists have been asking people in the community to help them uh, collect data and do research uh, in order to make scientific conclusions. And another important point to make is that one is not necessarily better than the other. Right? It depends a lot on your objectives. So two examples from our museum. On the left, you see the World Memory Project, which is an ongoing crowdsourcing project at the Holocaust Museum. We have asked people around the country to help us uh, input uh, data into our system of records that we have at the museum on victims and survivors of the Holocaust to make them easily searchable online. And this is a partnership with Ancestry.com. My project, History Unfolded, is a citizen history project because we're asking students and teachers primarily around the country and lifelong learners to look in their local newspaper collections on microfilm and online to discover how their communities reported on particular events of the Holocaust. So a big focus of our project is actually getting the students to act like historians, to go and do that research uh, as a historian would, and to address an ongoing historical question, which is what did Americans know about the Holocaust and how did they react? Uh, as you may know, this is one where there's been a lot of assumptions. People say nobody knew anything. And so we're testing that assumption. And um, as I'll say in a moment, we found that citizen history was the best way for our institution to address this question. Some of you may have already checked out the website if you came in early. Uh, it's newspapers.ushmm.org. We are using the hashtag history unfolded. So you can check out a lot of the work that's been done over the last year. I should mention that uh, we launched officially in February of this year. We were in beta just about a year ago in November. And we have a Facebook group, which is also uh, pretty active. So should we do citizen history? From my favorite movie, Jurassic Park, Ian Malcolm is concerned about the fact that uh, the researchers have created dinosaurs in the modern world. And so there's a good conversation at dinner before everything goes awry in which Malcolm says, your scientists were so preoccupied about whether they could clone dinosaurs, they didn't stop and think about whether they should. And I'm a big proponent of citizen history, but I think it's really important for everyone to understand if your institution is thinking about getting involved, is that you stop and think, why are we doing this? Uh, citizen history is kind of a buzzword or phrase nowadays. People think it's really kind of cool and trendy and they want to get involved. But I would caution you to think about well, what are the motives and does it really align with our objective? So why should you do citizen history? When you have a clear, valid, and meaningful purpose. All right? At our institution, we had an ongoing question for research. We simply don't have the staff or the resources to look at newspapers all over the country. So there was a great need to get the support of the community. And the community knows that. They realize that they are essential to answering this question. One of our goals was also to challenge assumptions about the Holocaust. Well, the best way we found to be able to do that is actually get people doing the research so they can learn while they're researching and be surprised at what was and was not covered uh, in their papers. Proper knowledge of past citizen project. We didn't just start this out of thin air. We've done a lot of research into citizen science, which has been kind of our anchor, but also previous citizen project. You can check on your phone as well, the Children of the Woods Ghetto Project. It's another one we have at our institution that came prior to this, and we learned a lot. 
Uh, one of the things we learned is you need sufficient preparation in order to implement this. So our project uh, started just about a year ago in terms of collecting data. We're going until spring 2018. And I would argue, based on my experience over the last year, I think we could have done even more preparation. Along with that, to really invest time, money, staff, and resources. I was hired at the museum to work 100% on History Unfolded. I have no other responsibilities. That was a huge investment of money and effort by our institution to hire me because we believe so strongly in this. And it goes with the fact that we have the support of our stakeholders uh, and our community because you can come up with a really great project, but if nobody wants to do it, it's probably not gonna get very far. So I'm gonna end with five takeaways for History Unfolded. First one, always lead with your objectives. Ideally create together with your stakeholders and everyone on the team. Involve everyone from the beginning. One of the things we learned is we've worked really heavily with our marketing office. They made those wonderful rat cards that are on the chairs next to you. But we probably should have even worked with them earlier to have them agree with us on our objectives. And to stay focused, because it's actually a lot easier to get off track than you would think. And remind your community and your stakeholders and everyone involved regularly. Uh, and I'll show you a couple examples about how we do that. Take risks, uh, realize that it's an ongoing thing, and uh, uh, make adjustments as necessary. So some practical examples. Some of you may know Alyssa Frankel, who's here at MCN. She's the project lead for History Unfolded. Well, at every meeting we have for stakeholders, she gives an agenda, and in that agenda, it shows our project objectives. And in that objective list, she mentions uh, why we're here, and she actually reads that at our meetings. On the right, you see we have a retrospective meeting that I just had about uh, two months ago, in which we tried to see, well, how are we doing? Are we actually where we want to be? Second takeaway, know your community. We created user personas before we started. Our key audience are teachers and students. We have a lot of lifelong learners that have been doing great work for us, and they give us the bulk of our articles. But we need to stay focused on our key audience and be willing to adjust. I am, part of my role is to intake as much information about the community as possible and report it to the team. So I carry a notebook. I have an online uh, Google Doc quality update in which I'm constantly taking notes. And so here's an example. Uh, we realized that our audience of primarily high school students didn't actually know how to read 20th century newspapers. We didn't realize that when we started, so we created this tutorial about uh, how to help them, and it's been pretty successful. Point three, scale up. So uh, it might be really exciting, your project, and you want to take over the world, but the best thing to do is to start with a small base and use personal outreach. Once you get your committed group talking, expand, use marketing efforts, and really continue to do uh, personal outreach, and then use digital tools. So here is a map of where we've gone uh, from just about a year ago. We had uh, 500 articles uh, in early 2015, and now we're at over 3,000 articles. We've done that a lot through our marketing efforts. Point four, this I think is huge. The community does not exist. That might really surprise you. Individuals exist, all right? So when I am doing outreach, I think of not a thousand, I think of a thousand individuals of different personalities and interests, not just one blob. I maintain a professional uh, and personal voice, which is hard to do. Uh, and we're also very specific in what we're asking our community to do. And so here's an example. We had a blog post. We use MailChimp in order to link to the post, and then we use social media in order to advertise that and get other people there. My voice is a little bit different depending on the platform, but I try to in personalize it in a professional way. Final point, develop meaningful relationships. I really prioritize in-person meetings for this project because I think it's more important to really get someone invested than it is to reach 10 people who aren't going to participate. I use phone calls, I'm proactive, and I check in. Uh, and the example here is a, a relationship we developed with the Library of Congress. Uh, I uh, worked with a librarian that we met just about a year ago. It took about half a year to really establish 
uh, a deep relationship, but we have it now. We've done two research sprints that have been very successful, and we're not planning on stopping anytime soon. But if I hadn't invested about six months of work into forming that relationship, we wouldn't have gotten there. So that's my presentation. Um, we need support from everyone in the community. So please, if you know anyone who's interested, please help us spread the word. I would love to talk with you more uh, after this session. Thank you so much. So our next presenter is Ryan King. He is the digital experience designer at the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery, blah, 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 Freer Gallery of Art and Author M. Sackler Gallery. An open source evangelist, he has joined the Smithsonian as a recent graduate of the Corcoran College of Art and Design's Exit, Exhibit Design MA program with a vision of fusing technology with the built museum environment. <laughs> 